So this is part two from chapter four called Reality Omnipresent in Sri Aurobindo's The Life Divine. But again, we find that we are being misled by words, deceived by the trenchant opposition of our limited mentality with its fond res reliance on verbal distinctions as if they perfectly represented ultimate truths and its rendering of our supramental experiences in the sense of those intolerant distinctions. Non-being is only a word. When we examine the fact it represents, we can no longer be sure that absolute non-existence has any better chance than the infinite self of being more than an ideative formation of the mind. We really mean by this nothing, something beyond the last term to which we can reduce our purest conception and our most abstract or subtle experience of actual being as we know or conceive it while in this universe. This nothing then is merely a something beyond positive conception. We erect a fiction of nothingness in order to overpass. By the method of total exclusion, all that we can know and are conscious of. Actually, when we examine closely the nihil of certain philosophers and philosophies, we begin to perceive that it is a zero which is all, or an indefinable infinite which appears to the mind a blank, because mind grasps only finite constructions but is in fact the only true existence, but it, um, but is in fact the only true existence. And when we say that out of non-being, being appeared, we perceive that we are speaking in terms of time about that which is beyond time. For what was the portentous date in the history of eternal nothing? on which being was born out of it? Or when will come that other date, equally formidable, on which an unreal all will relapse into the perpetual void? Sat and asat, or being and non-being, if they have both to be affirmed, must be conceived as if they have obtained simultaneously. They permit each other even though they refuse to mingle, both, since we must speak in terms of time, are eternal. And who shall persuade eternal being that it does not really exist, and only eternal non-being is? In such a negation of all experience, how shall we find the solution that explains all experience? Pure being is the affirmation by the unknowable of itself as the free base of all cosmic existence. We give the name of non-being to a contrary affirmation of its freedom from all cosmic existence. Freedom, that is to say, from all positive terms of actual existence, which consciousness in the universe can formulate to itself, even from the most abstract, even from the most transcendent. It does not deny them as a real expression of itself, but it denies its limitation by all expression or any expression whatsoever. The non-being permits the being, even as the silence permits the activity, but this simultaneous negation and affirmation, not mutually destructive, but complementary to each other, like all contraries, the simultaneous awareness of conscious self-being as a reality and the unknowable beyond as the same reality becomes realizable to the awakened human soul. Thus, was it possible for the Buddha to attain the state of nirvana and yet still act in the world, impersonable, impersonal in his inner consciousness, in his action the most powerful personality that we know of as having lived and produced results upon earth. When we, when we ponder these things, we begin to perceive how feeble 
in their self-assertive violence, and how confusing in their misleading distinctness are the words that we use. We begin also to perceive that the limitations we impose on the Brahman arise from a narrowness of experience in the individual mind, which concentrates itself on one aspect of the unknowable, and proceeds forthwith to deny or disparage all the rest. We tend always to translate too rigidly what we can conceive or know of the absolute into the terms of our own particular relativity. We affirm the one and identical by passionately discriminating and asserting the egoism of our own opinions and partial experiences against the opinions and partial experiences of others. It is wiser to wait, to learn, to grow, and since we are obliged for the sake of our self-perfection to speak of these things which no human speech can express, to search for the widest, the most flexible, the most Catholic affirmation possible, and found on it the largest and most comprehensive harmony. We recognize, then, that it is possible for the human consciousness in the individual to enter into a state in which relative existence appears to be dissolved, and even self seems to be an inadequate conception. It is possible to pass into a silence beyond the silence. But this is not the whole of our ultimate experience, nor the single and all-excluding truth. For we find that this nirvana, this self-extinction, while it gives an absolute peace and freedom to the soul within, is yet consistent in practice with a desireless but effective action without. This possibility of an entire motionless impersonality and void calm within doing outwardly the works of the eternal verities, love, truth, and righteousness, was perhaps the real gist of the Buddha's teaching. This superiority to ego and to the chain of personal workings and to the identification with mutable form and idea, not the petty ideal of an escape from the trouble and suffering of the physical birth. In any case, as the perfect man would combine in himself the silence and the activity, so also would the completely conscious soul reach back to the absolute freedom of the non-being without, therefore, losing its hold on existence and the universe. It would thus reproduce in itself perpetually the eternal miracle of the divine existence in the universe, yet always beyond it, and even, as it were, beyond itself. The opposite experience could only be a concentration of mentality in the individual upon non-existence, with the result of an oblivion and personal withdrawal from a cosmic activity still and always proceeding in the consciousness of the eternal being. <coughs> um, we'll do a part three.